Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Swerve Unicredit Foundation workshop on savings behavior in crisis and post-crisis times. When we had the idea to make a call for paper for this event a year ago already, we honestly did not anticipate that a year later, COVID would still be so relevant. But we suspected that the broader theme of what drives saving and portfolio behavior during crises and post-crisis recovery phases would remain relevant. The theme has moved center stage in the last few months. Forecasters, politicians, and central banks are confronted with a question whether and how fast COVID containment-induced forced savings will un unwind once the COVID crisis will more or less have been overcome? Will pent-up private demand result in a spending spree? Might this cause a surge in inflation, particularly if combined with continued highly expansionary fiscal and monetary policies? Or, alternatively, will households keep the accumulated higher stock of savings and not spend them? And how have forced and precautionary savings, ultra-low risk-free interest rates, as well as COVID-induced broader developments in work, organization, and housing preferences affected portfolio choice is, for instance, an observed shift to more risky assets, to gold and real estate here to stay. Clearly, it is very difficult to answer these questions since there are hardly any relevant historical precedents in recent history. Households' behavior largely hinges on personal preferences and psychology, which may differ strongly among demographic groups and countries and change over time depending on the state of the economy. Confronted with such new territory, both economic theory, for instance, behavioral economics, experimental economics, and household surveys, which study households' preferences and motivation and ask about planned behavior, can yield important insights. A third source of insights can be obtained from direct contacts and interaction with savers, so to speak, the accumulated wisdom of banks and insurances through their customer contacts and their day-to-day -day interactions with savers and investors. In this workshop, we bring together these three perspectives and sources of information. Insights from academic research are prominently represented by our keynote speaker, Michael Haliasos from Goethe University. For the practitioner's perspective, we are privileged to have Pierre Carlo Paduan. With this, may I invite Pierre Carlo to give his introductory keynote. Thank you, Ernest, and good afternoon to everybody. Also, on behalf of Unicredit, let me welcome you all warmly to this workshop, which promises to be very interesting. First of all, let me say a few facts. Let me remind that, of course, the propensity to save has seen a generalized increase uh, across the board in many different countries. But this has also been affected by different, different starting points with the U.S. differing from the EU countries in terms of initial propensity to save in so-called normal times, if there is still such a thing as normal times nowadays, but also within the European perimeter, where some countries have clearly a larger propensity to save in normal times than others. So in when assessing how much savings have gone up and will continue to go up if this is the case, we have also to consider national perspective in this respect. But also different dynamics and different motivations of excess savings. Uh, the Unicredit research team has recently produced an, a very interesting analysis of different dynamics of the drivers of excess savings, uh, pointing out to a very important difference between, say, the US and the EU. Uh, determinants of excess savings, where the U.S. increase is in excess savings is due primarily to increase in, in disposable income itself, the consequence of massive policy support coming to respond to the crisis, while in the case of most European countries, excess savings come from 
quote unquote a compression of consumption given to the fact that maybe the involuntary determinants of uh, of savings has been more relevant as i understand one ecb research paper uh, as highlighted so because of the lockdown we see more involuntary savings in Europe while we say more precautionary saving in the US. This may be a rough distinction, but I think that these two basic facts remain on the table and may be a guidance to also to what are the policy implications going forward. We are discussing about household behavior and their savings, although this should not make us forget that there are savings behavior also on the, from the corporate point of view. And this is important to keep in mind once we go to the fundamental question of what will happen next once we're moving out of the, of the pandemic crisis situation. What have companies been doing? Of course, companies have been suffering from the lockdown, from the recession, have been suffering from the fact that this has hit their, their, their financial situations. But this has, not, has also produced a quote unquote, precautionary saving behavior on the part of companies in terms of which we can see <clears throat> markedly in the increase of deposits in many countries in Europe, but also in the United States. So I'm recalling this fact because when we discuss about what are the policy implications of this excess savings rise, we should not forget that this is partially a phenomenon which impacts also on companies. There are two aspects in my modest view of the same phenomenon, large uncertainty looming on the, on, on, the, on the economics that prevents from consumption spending and prevents from investment spending, two different perspectives, but which eventually coalesce, so to speak, to prolong the recession. So this will be another policy uh, implication to look forward to. So what will happen? Uh, the research team in Unicredit has produced a number of scenarios which point to overall a modest resumption of consumption once the pandemic crisis is uh, largely behind our, our shoulders. And let me recall them, let me recall them very quickly. There are at least four reasons why we should be not so optimistic about the resumption of consumption in the post-crisis situation. One is, and uh, and Ernest mentioned it, limited pent-up demand for services. The usual story that when you are, go out of the lockdown, you're not going twice to the barber shop to have a haircut, you just go once. But this, of course, is only half a joke. In a service-intensive economy like Italy, this is maybe a dramatic situation in many situations, many, many cases. Second reason for expecting a slow resumption of consumption is that if you consider savings, accumulated savings as wealth accumulation, you would expect a wealth effect on consumption. This is most likely to be too limited, to be limited. So again, one reason to be prudent. Third point, we all know that savings are, the savings are characterized by an unequal distribution, where saving propensity to save are higher with higher wealth and income levels, and therefore these uh, part segments of the population will be, uh, other things equal, less prone to increase consumption once there is an, an, end of the, an end of the pandemic impact. Fourth reason, precautionary savings may persist, and this is true both of households and companies, as I was mentioning earlier. So there are a number of reasons which suggest that savings may remain with us for some time and there will be a, a, an adjustment process which will be longish before we go back to normality. However, my fantastic research team at Unicredit also suggested there might be a, a reason for being, for looking the other way. And they labeled this scenario the Roaring Twenties meaning that once the COVID crisis is actually behind us, the compressed preference, the compressed consumption, the compressed desire to have a better lifestyle will explode, so to speak, in a spending spree, which will accelerate, at least in the short term, spending and will counteract 
the slow down factors which I just mentioned. All in all, and I'm finished, the, uh, uh, the questions that uh, Ernest put on the table or what will be the outcome of when we go out of this force saving compression, force saving uh, increase because of cons cons compression of consumption, it's not obvious. Certainly, there will be a combination, let me repeat it, of long-lasting precautionary savings, both on the household side and on the, on the company side. This suggests an obvious con conclusion that the policy will be needed not only to provide a direct boost to the economy in terms of, for instance, public investment or reforms, but also guide the perspective in the long term and reestablish confidence and decrease uncertainty in a permanent way. So for policymakers and practitioners, the challenge ahead is very daunting. But I'll stop here and thank you for your attention and look forward to listening to your remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre Carlo. We will now turn to Mikhail. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation um, to give a talk. Uh, the talk, the title of the talk is The Pandemic Reset and Its Implications for Household Finances. This is a, a very multifaceted uh, topic. I won't be able to touch on uh, very many things, but um, here is um, um, my thread for uh, today's talk. The pandemic has left people with higher average savings, as has already been mentioned, and we're going to see um, some pictures, and also with differential employment prospects. And it has also left uh, countries with differential prospects for fiscal support, different fiscal space, and different needs for sectoral shifts. And I'm going to show you also um, a, a study that uh, illustrates this uh, cross-country heterogeneity. The pandemic reset will require shifts, uh, labor shift, activity shifts, and open up investment and employment opportunities. And there are lots of positive aspects about that that are normally stressed, but there is also another aspect that is closer to our interests in this uh, in today's uh, event that I would like to bring up and stress the potential for further social polarization. And this is who is going to take advantage of these opportunities, who is going to be able to access these higher returns that are going to be out there and the lower borrowing um, costs and how are people going to feel um, in the way going forward. So let me uh, start by saying that uh, even early studies had uh, found effects of COVID on financial behavior. And this is, um, this is household spending in the US measured in April, 2020. And the initial reaction of people was to cut consumption considerably, especially, you know, in the obvious sectors of transportation, travel, entertainment, clothing, and consumer durables, um, but also to reduce demand for loans, to get out of risky assets, and to uh, postpone or suspend loan repayments. So this was sort of the initial reaction to the crisis. Now, if we come to today, uh, here is um, a picture from OECD, which talks about the uh, flows. So these are the net household saving rates. The blue dots are uh, what they were before, uh, and the um, the, the average between 2000 and 2019 and the red dots uh, where they are today. And you see that across all countries, there has been an increase in this flow, the net saving rate, um, in some countries bigger than in others. Uh, you will see also that 
the ranking of countries by net saving rates uh, seems to have changed uh, a little bit relative to the average behavior uh, in the past, but the, the general idea is that net saving has gone up. And then the, the bottom one uh, is from Moody's and it looks at the stock uh, and these are excess savings. So, so these are savings, not saving, the stock of savings uh, compared to uh, 20, you know, to, to normal behavior. And that's, these are estimates. And you see that, uh, you know, on the, on the whole, they are uh, positive. Uh, in all cases, they are positive, but of course there is uh, country variation, cross country variation. So how, you know, Two questions is what have people done with the extra savings? How do they feel about the future? And, you know, the top panel um, finds evidence. So these are percent of survey respondents finds evidence that, you know, more people are saving, fewer people saying that they have no spare cash uh, than before. There has been some increase in uh, participation in stock mutual funds, actually considerable increase. There has been uh, some increase in participation in retirement funds. And the, the bottom panel is um, quite surprising or positive, you might say, that uh, how people feel, how, how um, confident they are, how consumers, uh, uh, how confident consumers are, seems to have re rebounded um, completely after the pandemic. Actually, the dip in the pandemic was not as bad as the dip in the financial crisis, but now we are uh, above, we are back to uh, the, the pre-pandemic uh, levels of this, uh, of this index. Here is another uh, source this uh, Think Forward initiative that my CEPR network on household finance also um, is a partner of, and uh, together with fin and tech uh, companies. And uh, there has been a, a recent survey there of in uh, the countries that you see of about 8,000 uh, adults. And in all cases, in all countries, uh, people consider their current financial health uh, inferior to what it was uh, before COVID-19. But you will see that in all cases, except for the uh, case of Turkey, where the financial situation, the financial environment seems to be um, quite problematic, uh, there is optimism that the financial health of people is going to improve um, in the uh, next year. So feeling in control of income and expenses, managing my money without worries or stress. Uh, so, so there is this optimism uh, that uh, echoes, if you like, the confidence uh, index over here from a completely different source. And here, what I also find interesting is, you know, what do people uh, do? What measures do Europeans take to improve their financial health? And you will see that in the top, um, it, there is a number of measures that are, if you like, a little bit conservative, conserving finances, um, you know, being careful about things, spend and shop consciously, keep track of my income and expenses, control and or reduce my spending, control and or reduce my levels of debt, save regularly. So these are the popular um, reactions of people uh, to to this question, and if you if you are to read uh, further down, um, where you know you might get into more interesting household finance investment, if you like financial investment um, considerations, there isn't much action there. So, uh, for instance, learn about finance, look for financial information learn about finance, look for financial information in my bank website, talk to financial experts, you know, very, very minimal. Learn and look for smart investment options, you know, much more minimal at this point in time than actually, um, you know, these 
precautionary or conservative measures um, to, to preserve the financial situation to avoid trouble. Okay, so that can that can also be informative about how people to view their future today, right? Now, there have been distributional implications of the pandemic, and uh, there will be even more. So across countries and across demographic groups, they, there is different vulnerability to lockdowns. And actually, the ability to work from home has been found in studies to be the most important consideration in terms of unemployment, switches to unemployment, but also to changes in uh, income. Um, there is international variation in the in fiscal space and in terms of levels and prospects for fiscal support. There have been different approaches to unemployment, Kurzarbeit and furlough schemes versus strengthening and unempl providing unemployment benefits to finance transitions. And we, we will see in a minute that, you know, we have similar current successes in unemployment, but they may have different future implications depending on the measures that have uh, been taken to control unemployment. And there is diff there are different needs for intersectoral shifts um, in, across across countries. So here are some uh, data that actually had become available, you know, from the IMF even early on in July 2020, linking uh, GDP per capita to actually uh, possibilities for remote work. And you see that in richer countries, these possibilities are uh, typically uh, um, higher. And, um, you know, in the bottom panel, you see that by education, um, there are differences within each um, age group. So you can see that there is across different age groups variation in the potential to work um, remotely. Uh, within each age group, there is um, a very positive uh, slope uh, with respect to education. But interestingly, if you control for education or if you look at um, um, the same education group across age groups, you don't see that much uh, variation. And, you know, the long term future of work, you know, after this pandemic reset that is expected to have more permanent effects is that work will be more digitized, that uh, there will be remote working. So that can also um, reduce the uh, bottleneck of expensive housing because it will allow people to move in suburbs and in uh, less congested areas. And um, actually, home workers already report higher levels of happiness and productivity. Depending on the industry structure, on the economic structure in different countries, um, there is variation across countries um, that we saw uh, on the percent of jobs that cannot be done from home or can be done from home, but also uh, on the emphasis on sensitive uh, sectors uh, to the pandemic. And of course, to the fiscal stimulus. There is international variation in fiscal stimulus. So these are IMF um, data, recent IMF data. Um, advanced economies uh, have provided much more stimulus than um, emerging markets and uh, low income developing countries, uh, the stimulus is going down and is expected uh, to go down further in uh, 2022 and beyond. Now here are the differences in unemployment across the Atlantic, the experience across the Atlantic. And you see that you know, in the in the top panel uh, on the left is U.S. unemployment. On the right is um, uh, Europe. 
And uh, you see that uh, the U.S. experienced a much uh, higher uh, spike, bigger spike in unemployment than, uh, than Europe. But if you go to the middle panel, uh, you will see that um, a lot of that was uh, this um, temporary uh, layoffs and the, the importance of these temporary layoffs uh, for U.S. unemployment uh, has uh, dropped uh, dramatically. So if you, and at the bottom, you know, there is a Eurozone unemployment and uh, actually the picture both in the Eurozone and uh, in the US, the overall picture for unemployment looks, uh, looks uh, quite good and uh, not too dissimilar, but um, Europe has much more, uh, has been much more engaged in uh, preserving jobs uh, whereas the approach uh, through unemployment benefits in the U.S. has tended to uh, support more reallocation of labor across uh, sectors. So although the, the rates of unemployment, the current rates of unemployment can be very similar, maybe uh, the implications, uh, especially for people, for households uh, going forward, uh, are going to be um, uh, quite different. You know, they need to retrain, reallocate, they need to uh, move to a different uh, sector, um, is going to be uh, differentially handled across the, uh, the two um, blocks. Now, I said that overall unemployment in the Eurozone seems uh, you know, to be quite, uh, quite good and to have fallen, but we should not uh, forget the uh, significant heterogeneity across countries and especially, you know, the very high unemployment rates in some uh, countries, uh, in fact, some of the uh, crisis countries uh, are still um, featuring here quite prominently. Here, I think, is, is an impressive uh, matrix. Uh, constructed by McKinsey Global Institute. Uh, they are looking at um, uh, eight countries and uh, they are going sector by sector and they say, you know, they are depicting uh, expand, expanding sectors and contracting sectors, likely contracting sectors. Um, and you know the the bluer it is, the the greater the expansion, and the closer it is to black, uh, the the bigger the contraction. And uh, these sectoral um, you know these sectoral changes are going to necessitate labor moves and are going to have an impact for uh, household finances as well. And um, in fact. You know, the estimate by McKinsey is that, you know, more than 100 million workers will have to find uh, new, more qualified jobs by 2030. And this is a 25% increase to on uh, previous projections. So what you see here, first is the need for reallocation. Uh, second, you need which uh, sect, you see which uh, sectors are likely to be expanding and which sectors are likely to be contracting. Third, you see that there is considerable heterogeneity across countries uh, in the fraction of sectors, if you like, in the number of sectors that will be expanding and contracting. You, you do have situations in which, you know, the same sector in some countries is going to contract and in others is going to expand, although, you know, there is you know, more agreement than disagreement uh, in the categorization uh, here. Uh, so, of course, the problems that uh, countries are going to face in the transitions are going to uh, differ to some extent, but also have some commonality. Now, the emphasis when uh, people make these analyses, there is a lot of emphasis on labor market behavior, and on income inequality, uh, on you know who becomes unemployed, for how long, how can we retrain people, move to a new job, retrain more easily, etc. And these, of course, are tremendously important considerations. But 
I want to uh, make a pitch um, today uh, to consider also another set of important considerations which have to do with household financial behavior and uh, wealth inequality, which is closer, if you like, to the emphasis of our of our uh, event uh, today and to our common uh, interests. So there are all these opportunities uh, to, uh, you know, there are new sectors coming up. Uh, they, there are growing sectors that would invite investment. And the question is, a question is, who is more likely to invest? Uh, you know, which households, if you like, are more likely to partake uh, of, this, uh, of these investment opportunities in private business holdings, in uh, stock holdings, uh, but also in gaining access to low cost borrowing opportunities. And that could be, you know, maybe to set up uh, a business or to expand the business, but also to finance transitions, uh, personal transitions from uh, one um, declining sector to an expanding sector, etc. Who will manage to handle the financial requirement of these employment transitions better? There will be consequences of these moves and these opportunities for um, accumulation of retirement wealth. Um, there may be a need for more years of work. There may be a need for a smarter allocation of retirement savings. Who are going to be able to handle these challenges better uh, and who not? Who is likely to manage? We saw there are accumulated savings and. Uh, um, and both uh, previous uh, speakers uh, in the session um, stressed those uh, rightly. Uh, who is likely to manage the accumulated savings more efficiently and profitably? Consumption is uh, one possibility. It may be pent up uh, demand and we, we are likely to experience an increase in consumption, uh, but who is going to be able to manage uh, to, to plan this increase in the best possible way and who is uh, going to be able to manage the remaining, you know, the stock of uh, savings that has been accumulated and will not be spent. So, in essence, who will access higher returns and uh, incur lower debt costs among, uh, among households? And here I'm going just to remind you of things you already know, these are pictures from the Household Finance and Consumption uh, Survey. Actually, it's the second wave, 2014-15. Uh, it's, you know, things don't change so dramatically um, across waves in terms of what I'm describing here, but you see on the left participation rates uh, on the top on financial assets and on the bottom on uh, real uh, different types of real assets. And you see actually, you know, and on the right hand side, you know, these these colored um, um, pictures are average portfolio composition, average portfolio shares as you go across the wealth distribution. And what you see is that the people who are more likely to invest, dramatically more likely to invest in private businesses are at the top of the wealth distribution, um, um, in housing and, and real assets. Uh, they are, you know, they start from somewhere around the middle of the wealth distribution. And we're talking here about the overall uh, Eurozone. We're not talking about individual countries where there is variation uh, as well. And uh, you also find that, you know, stock uh, holdings and taking advantage of these uh, opportunities uh, is not for all, uh, but it tends to, uh, it tends to be for people in the, in the higher uh, ends of the wealth distribution. Wealth inequality in uh, the Eurozone has been going up from wave to wave. And here, you know, there's a whole range of uh, in possible indicators and all have been going up. You have the Gini, you have the ratio of the 90th percentile in the distribution to the 10th percentile. You have the share of top 10%, uh, top 5%. Uh, 
and, and pretty much all of these indicators have been going up, and these are pre-COVID, okay? So uh, without such, uh, well, of course, with the disruption of the fiscal crisis, but not with the disruption of the COVID crisis yet. And the other thing that has caught my attention is in, in the survey uh, in the US, there are longer term data on uh, wealth distribution. And uh, here is a picture of how the more educated people uh, with uh, college or some college have uh, been eating into the share of total household wealth um, into the into total household wealth by increasing their share uh, as we go from 1989 uh, all the way to 2020. So it seems that the educated uh, are um, getting uh, more and more of the uh, total wealth pie. Now I talked about social cohesion and if you like social polarization, how about attitudes? And uh, this uh, this graph is from a paper we're about a working paper we're about to release with uh, Thomas Janssen and uh, Chankara Bulut, and um, this uh, this plots on the horizontal axis the share of household wealth that is uh, um, held by the top ten percent of the wealth distribution, so the top ten share, and on the vertical axis. The, perception, the percentage of people from Eurobarometer who say, I have equal opportunities for getting ahead in life like everyone else. And you, you see something very peculiar and very strange that in more unequal countries, more people uh, think there are equal opportunities. And then you look at a different statement. I believe that by and large people get what they deserve. So that's a fairness statement. And you see again that in more unequal countries, more people think that the outcomes are fair. And you're wondering, you know, where on earth is this coming from? And here, if you, um, what we did is we broke the sample into two and we considered um, people with a college education on the left and this high school sample, not necessarily high school, but you know the rest, uh, people without college education. And you see that this positive slope comes entirely from the educated people. And actually, uh, it has a negative slope, but it's statistically insignificant uh, here. Uh, that's in terms of beliefs in opportunity and in beliefs in fairness, the same story. Again, insignificant on the right hand side, but the whole thing comes from the educated uh, people, which makes us uh, uh, sort of suspect that the opportunities um, are more for the educated and not for the rest. And actually, for income inequality, you don't get anything, uh, any such relationship. So in the Final part of today, um, I want to uh, point your attention to very recent research on wealth inequality, uh, quite fascinating new, new uh, work on heterogeneous uh, returns by two sets of uh, authors, Bach, Calvé, um, Sodini, and uh, Fager and Guiso, Malacrino, uh, Pistaferi. And what they find is that the wealthier people tend to have persistently higher expected returns, but also persistently higher actual returns, and that there is intergenerational, a considerable degree of intergenerational uh, persistence. So the wealthier you are, the more likely you are to be accessing the high returns and the low borrowing costs as a household, the low borrowing costs um, that are available. And the emphasis of the two papers is different. Bach, Calvé, and Sodini uh, stress more the tendency of the wealthier people to undertake higher systematic risk 
to invest in uh, risky um, assets. Whereas um, the uh, other sets, Fager and Guiso Malacrino Pista Ferry, uh, really put an, uh, more emphasis. They say, yes, of course, that's true, but even conditional of where you are investing. Uh, the wealthier people tend to have a higher returns. And what plays a big role in that is um, observe innate ability, which is manifested in education. So the higher education people tend to have higher returns, uh, but uh, it can also reflect all sorts of unobservables like financial sophistication, ability to process and use financial information, uh, talent to manage businesses. So that's one uh, mechanism of wealth propagation, the wealthier earn higher returns. And the other mechanism that we think we are uncovering um, in our uh, recent paper or upcoming paper is that if you are exposed to greater wealth, but not income inequality, income is not uh, playing a role, but greater wealth inequality at the launch of uh, your economic life, then if you are educated, then you are going to be more likely to be motivated by this exposure to higher wealth inequality to invest in risky assets and to attain higher wealth levels and higher positions in your cohort specific wealth uh, distribution in areas where there is wealth mobility above median wealth mobility where that is possible whereas if you are not if you are less educated uh, you don't tend to react uh, to be similarly energized by exposure to wealth uh, inequality so here's my final um, slide. What are the implications of what uh, I told you and, and uh, conclusions? So this pretty much repeats what I um, had set out at the beginning that we have um, heterogeneity among savings and employment prospects um, across people. We have um, interesting heterogeneity across countries in terms of fiscal space and the type and uh, need for sectoral shifts and the extent the pandemic reset will open up investment and employment opportunities in different sectors this creates opportunities of course but it also generates a potential for further social polarization as the more educated and the wealthy are more likely to be responsive to these opportunities and uh, the less educated and less wealthy are, not, uh, are less likely to be taking advantage of these opportunities and of these uh, higher returns. And uh, this could lead to increased social polarization, but also uh, to problems with uh, financial stability and uh, bad decisions, financial decisions uh, by people. Mm -hmm. So that's it, what I uh, wanted to stress uh, this time. And thank you very much, Michael. This was a tour de force and a really very comprehensive um, assessment and an excellent uh, view of the latest literature and even your uh, intended and your working progress. Uh, the floor is open for questions now. I have two questions so far uh, for you. Uh, the first is, if I may read it out, from slides 26 and following, which you just, uh, ah, I just uh, removed. presented a couple of minutes ago. Yeah. Uh, I take that the, wealthy, that the wealthier people benefit more from a low credit interest rate environment and from rises in risky asset prices. So what does this imply for distributional effects of expansionary monetary policy in your view? Yes, so interestingly, you know, these, uh, these data and these uh, results are um, taken from different periods in which 
interest rates were not um, necessarily so low. So they tend to, you know, these results tend to be um, even conditional, um, you know, to reflect that for any given level of interest rates, the best opportunities accrue or are taken advantage of by the wealthier people and the more educated people. Now, of course, when you have a low interest rate environment in which, you know, save, you know, bank deposits yield nothing and you have the fees actually uh, to have your you know costs of uh, holding money in the bank etc uh, the problem you know does get intensified but the i think the nice aspect of these results is that even if you know we enter a different environment in which um, central uh, you know central bank monetary policy raises interest rates again you know the the better opportunities will be taken um, uh, advantage of by the uh, wealthier and the more educated people so some people might say you know I was talking to John Campbell a couple of days ago and I mentioned this and he said oh this is you know uh, conservative Americans uh, are going, Republicans are going to say this is fantastic you know the the educated take advantage of these uh, opportunities and that's what we want and uh, because these are the people who are going to be generating jobs for others etc cetera, etc cetera. but it's actually not only the jobs it's it's retirement wealth it's borrowing you know also for consumption purposes it is really uh, financial distress uh, etc so um, the question is what can we do to support the people who don't have the innate ability or who don't have the facility to manage finances to avoid problems and to take advantage of opportunities but they i think the the distribution of considerations are important yes and will remain important even when interest rates start going up so would it be wrong if i summarize um you know a bit bluntly that the wealthier and the better educated will benefit from any kind of monetary policy, be it low rates yeah. or high rates, and it's actually more financial education levels and 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 related things that are more important. I think uh, I think so. Uh, yes, I think the difference is, you know, what is the default um, choice of the less educated? And the less financially sophisticated, and it can be, and, and I know in, in in a number of countries, uh, also it is very much, you know, bank deposits. I mean, you see that you know they put money in the bank, and that's it. Uh, they don't do anything else. And there, of course, you know, the higher the interest rate, you know, the more they are going to be able to earn on these uh, deposits. Okay, sort of, uh, you know, very simply, um, but. But in relative terms, they will, yes, again, be losing. Yeah. I have another question by Ariona Rebi, and he's asking, uh, what's your opinion regarding the investment of saving in cryptocurrency? Do you think that the use of higher digitalization will, 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 will support a development in that direction? I think, of course, you know, making it easier to invest in uh, um, in any particular financial asset through digitization is going to uh, is going to promote um, uh, investment in it. I'm not sure if you know this type of investment is where we would like to encourage the least financially sophisticated or less educated people to go. To uh, make the to bridge the gap with the wealthier and more financially sophisticated because of the high risks uh, involved and the uh, difficulties in making these um, uh, choices uh, without uh, creating bad financial prospects for uh, oneself. So I think. But again, you know, if this is more a, an automatic a reflex reaction uh, to uh, people who 
don't know much about uh, how to allocate uh, their savings and they find these, uh, they get these opportunities, uh, then that, uh, that can be you know, more of a problem than a solution to their problem. I have a question here, which uh, I think would be suitable and interesting for both speakers. Against the background of uh, the introduction, uh, I think it would be interesting for the audience before we go into the uh, then more academic papers and then the panel discussion, what your uh, overall expectation would be to what extent will the uh, will accumulated forced savings turn into a spending spree given the very as aspects of inequality in the case of what Michael uh, presented and given the various pros and cons that Pierre Carlo you presented uh, in your uh, introductory keynote. So what would be your your best guess? Will we have a, a very strong recovery as some forecasters uh, are now increasingly saying or will it rather be quite modest and and the stock of savings will be kept? Well, thanks for the question. It's very difficult to answer precisely, but my <clears throat> gut feeling is that we are going to see a period of uh, relatively fast recovery as a bounce back phenomenon, but then a slowing down a recovery as a more substantial steady state new growth rate. So as long as uncertainty looms large in terms of what will be the post pandemic scenario in terms of reallocation of resources, strategic sectors going forward and so forth. I would see that after the bounce back, I would see slower growth unless governments do what we need them to do, that is to produce monetary and financial support, but also an allocation function in terms of good investment and building up good debt rather than bad debt, as Mario Draghi always suggests. So I would expect a combination of the two features. But can I, have, can I ask a question to Michael? Yeah. If I if I may, I, I found his, uh, his presentation extremely interesting and stimulating, and I would have many questions for him. But let me ask you one question: Is there any evidence, to your knowledge, that financial education does change behavior in a significant way in terms of consumers' choice, and therefore move towards more diversification and sustainability? I'm I was personally involved in financial education efforts in my country, which is. Lagging, lagging behind that. Thank you. Yeah, this is uh, this is a very interesting, a very uh, important question. So there are two levels uh, to it. You you were very specific. You said financial education. Let me backtrack yes. for one uh, second and say you know I stressed education level, not financial education necessarily. Uh, and you know a a a zeroth question before your question is. Uh, if we just extend education uh, requirements in a country, would we expect to find better financial behavior and stuff like that? And, you know, there is very recent uh, research uh, by the Guiso Fager and uh, Pista Ferry Group, uh, but also by others in the, in the US, which suggests no, <clears throat> that it's not about education. Education per se is an outcome, is a joint outcome of um, innate ability uh, together with the better financial behavior. Um, and coming to your question, um, there is a, a big literature since 2005, which has uh, pushed and tested uh, this very much, has found you know, a positive association between financial um, literacy and outcomes. So there are two levels, right? One is, um, is there a causal effect of financial literacy and outcomes? And initially, it seemed more like an association without causality. But now, more and more, there are uh, a number, a big number of papers that implement instruments um, and find exogenous instruments and, and do find that there is an effect of financial literacy on financial behavior, a positive effect. But then the other question is, how do we increase financial literacy, right? 
And uh, that has to do with the choice of education programs or education, you know, how we, uh, educational policy, financial education policy. And it seems that there's a lot of action if you put financial education in schools, so for the very young people, um, but it is less clear and less easy to do later in life. But uh, another piece of work that I recently did and, uh, and published suggests that there are also externalities. So if you educate some people, and they improve their financial uh, literacy, uh, they also influence the people around them. So we, we have found evidence that there are financial literacy externalities. It's like, you know, learning computers from your kid, um, but, um, um, you know, it is on a broader scale. It's not just the young educating the others, but, uh, you know, more financially educated peers influencing the financial behavior of their neighbors and of the people they interact with. So it's, it's a big, it's a big issue. Yeah. Thank you very much, Michael and Pierre Carlo for these very interesting insights.